In this lecture, we'll discuss using machine learning to improve institutional decision making. We care about improving the decision making of institutions and political leaders so as to reduce the chance of rash or possibly catastrophic decisions. Better machine learning systems that can assist with decision making can be used in high stakes situations where human decision makers may not have much foresight or where passions are inflamed or where decisions must be made extremely quickly, perhaps based on gut reactions. Under these conditions, humans are liable to make egregious errors. Historically, the closest we have come to a global catastrophe has been in these situations, including in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Another situation that comes to mind is COVID, where political leaders made many poorly informed decisions. So, decision-making systems could be used in high-stakes situations, and they could improve the epistemics of political leaders and command and control centers. Likewise, these technologies could reduce the existential risks posed by hyper-persuasive AI systems. And it could allow politicians to more prudently wield the power of future technology. I suppose a closing motivation is a quote from Carl Sagan, which is that if we continue to accumulate only power and not wisdom, we will surely destroy ourselves. A way to improve institutional decision-making and epistemics may be through forecasting. Forecasting is the process of making predictions about events. These events could be about the climate. They could be geopolitical. They could relate to industry and the economy, or they could relate to events like pandemics. These predictions could possibly be continually refined as new information becomes available. A basic type of forecasting is statistical forecasting. Here one might use a moving average or autoregression or some other simple time series models. Judgmental forecasting uses a forecaster's judgment integrated from statistical models, unstructured data sources such as news, uh, dynamically updating information and accumulated knowledge. You could use a priori reasoning and forms of intuition. So judgmental forecasting is somewhat broader. Forecasting relates to various fields of study. For example, information retrieval can provide the context for a judgmental forecast. An information retrieval system, for example, could retrieve relevant news articles that could inform the predictor about recent current events that may shape its prediction. Temporal modeling for real-time information aggregation also relates to forecasting. And we want our predictions to be calibrated in these highly uncertain events. So we don't want them being overconfident or underconfident. So another important goal of forecasting is attaining calibration. Before we get too excited about an Oracle machine learning system that can see the far future, note that there are limitations to forecasting. One of the main limitations is because the world has many chaotic components. Chaos theory reminds us that many systems that are governed by deterministic dynamics can exhibit practically unpredictable behavior. For example, chaos theory often brings up the example of the butterfly effect, where a small change in a system, such as a butterfly flapping its wings, could many years in the future end up causing counterfactually a hurricane to form. For example, if one wants to predict farther out into the future, for each day that one wants to predict out in the future, one might need exponentially more precision. Let's look at a simple example. Here's a logistic map. It's governed by the following recurrence relation. So it's simply x times 1 minus x multiplied by some factor lambda. It becomes highly unstable and chaotic when lambda is greater than about 3.56. So here's an example of the logistic map. Meanwhile, if I add a small perturbation to the initial value, I end up getting fairly different outcomes. So while it tracked for most of it, later on, I can't really predict 
what's going to happen in the system. That's sensitivity to initial conditions. To highlight some of the limitations of forecasting, I'll mention another example. Let's say we have a box of gas particles, and these obey Newtonian mechanics in that we precisely know the particle's initial positions and velocities. Let's say we want to predict the future state of these particles. Now, let's show how sensitive this system is by leaving out the gravitational pull of a single electron at the edge of the universe. How much time must pass before this damages our predictions? Well, as it happens, the gravity of a single electron 10,000 million light years away will change the predicted angle of a gas particle, or that a gas particle leaves its 50th collision by 90 degrees, which is to say it changes substantially. So it only takes 50 collisions, which happens in a very small fraction of a microsecond, only 50 collisions in the predictions will be damaged because we didn't account for the electron that was 10,000 million light years away. As a second example, assume a billiard player is calculating a shot on an idealized pool table, which is perfectly flat and smooth. After how many billiard ball collisions will the player need to factor in the gravity of the people standing around the table? The answer is around six or seven collisions. As we can see, highly precise predictions of the future are in many cases impractical. For larger geopolitical questions, a rule of thumb is that humans have difficulty predicting beyond approximately a year and a half. Some properties that we would want from good forecasters are that they have a broad adaptation to many different question types and variety of topics and time horizons. We want them to have high calibration of their probabilities. We want highly granular predictions with fine intervals of likelihoods. We want great resolution across the zero to one probability range so they can't just discern between already highly likely events. They can weigh in on events of various different probabilities. We also want them to be highly responsive to new data and dynamically aggregate new information and update it. Potentially, machines could perform better than humans at forecasting. It could be used to automate it. They have some advantages over humans. They can read and process text faster. They could discern patterns in noisy high-dimensional spaces that potentially humans couldn't. They can be trained from past data, so one could imagine training a model on all the data before World War I and then asking it to predict whether there'll be a large global conflict. You can't do this with humans, but it's conceptually feasible with a machine learning system. So there are some reasons for wanting machine learning forecasting systems. But to have systems that can do that well, the first step, as ever, is to measure the performance. So we need a benchmark. The AutoCast benchmark is a machine forecasting data set with thousands of diverse forecasting questions, these span various forecasting horizons, topics, and answer formats, and it comes with a corpus of news organized by date. An example question is in the figure above. Let's look at further examples, but first I'd like to note that the models are performing retrodiction. So they're looking at historical examples, and they're not seeing news articles after the question has been resolved or when the answer is known. This way they can't cheat. We're simulating it as though the models are looking at data in time and it doesn't have access to information in the future. This allows us to use historical data to measure model performance. So we could give models questions such as, will a Tesla car demonstrate fully autonomous capability before the end of 2021? The resolution is no. So we can see that this was a binary question. Another question one could ask is, when will the US-Canada border reopen? The resolution was a date. So here the model was predicting a date. What will Putin's approval rating be three months after the potential invasion of Ukraine? The answer for this was a numerical answer. 
How many vacancies will arise on the Supreme Court in 2021? And the answer for this is a multiple choice option. The resolution was option A. As we can see, the model needs to have depth in many topics and a large breadth of knowledge in order to be a good forecaster. Here are the results. We can see that the performance increases with retrieval. That's the FID static and FID temporal models. But it still lags behind human crowd performance, which is at about 82.5%. Now, I'll note that there's some selection bias in these questions. because One might think humans are getting 82.5%. How impressive. But people won't pose questions. It'll be way too difficult for the humans to answer. So they're not going to ask of all the companies that are currently existent and less worth less than a million dollars, which will be worth over a billion in three years' time? That will be much too difficult for humans to answer. Or if they ask them basic stock market prediction questions too, it'll be unlikely that humans will do much better than the market on that. That is to say, many important questions won't be asked of human forecasters on these sorts of prediction market sites. As mentioned before, calibration is also important. We want more than just accuracy. And so some tools for calculating calibration might be the Breyer score or the RMS calibration error, or models could potentially output confidence intervals, and we would want those to be calibrated. For information about that, see the interpretable uncertainty lecture. In addition to forecasting systems, in the future, we might want ML advisory systems. These advisory systems could learn from a large amount of historical data and diverse experiences. They could help brainstorm new options and questions and risks. They could put unknown unknowns on a person's radar and turn them into a known unknown, drawing from their diverse experiences and vast knowledge. They could identify crucial factors and stakeholders and trade-offs. They could propose metrics and alternative courses of actions. So this is another area that doesn't yet have a benchmark, but hopefully in the future we'll have models that can help political leaders do this as well.